Good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another edition of Talking Point. My name is Faraz Patel. We say jazakallah to you for joining us. We will be in your company for the next 45 to 50 minutes. And wow, what a week it has been from the political front. Of course, the Section 89 panel will hand over the report to Parliament, which of course found that President Cyril Ramaphosa has a case to answer on in for on impeachable offences. Of course, the panel, uh, which handed its report to the National Assembly last week, Wednesday, said that in light of the information placed before it, it concluded that on the face of it, the president may have violated the constitution. Now, this relates to the alleged cover-up of a crime on his Limpopo farm, which, of course, Palapala pala in February 2020. Now, we're going to be having two different conversations with regards to this. We're going to have the constitutional law take on it, and we're going to have the political take on it. So let us start off with the constitutional law take on it, and it gives me great pleasure in welcoming constitutional law expert, Professor Pierre de Foss. Professor, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, Professor, I just want to start off, of course, I mean, I read your Daily yeah. Maverick article, and even though there may be flaws on it, and we're going to touch on each of the flaws, the president still has a case to answer, doesn't he? Yes, so there are clearly unanswered questions. So the panel um, report makes it clear that we don't really fully know yet exactly what happened. Um, things, Some things are unexplained. You know, it's, uh, there are not many people who are going to stuff uh, 500,000 or more 100,000 rands of um, dollars uh, in their couch. Um, they are all these kind of issues that we don't really know. So there is clearly a um, um, there's a important um, uh, obligation really on the president to come clean and to account whether this process is the best way to do it at this point when all the information is not in yet. That is, of course, uh, the big question um, that is also partly going to be answered before the constitutional court if they decide to hear the case. Prof. I want to talk about prima facie evidence because the thing about prima facie evidence is that we only know something based on one look at mm. it, which needs a mm. deeper look at it. Mm. Uh, how much does this help the president or how much deeper can it go for there to be a case probably against him? So the thing with with the panel um, report and its obligations, but any legal process really, is that the person who makes the decision can only make the decision based on the information before them. Mm -hmm. The panel was restricted in what information they had because it's only the information that the those people who proposed the motion and any other members of the National Assembly placed before them. Um, and then the question is, um, is this evidence? The, the president in his papers to the constitutional court said, well, many of these things are hearsay, so they're not really admissible in a court of law. It's conjecture. It's what we think might have happened because we're not sure. Um, and so uh, this is the big problem, is that uh, we think something is maybe off, but you have to have evidence. Prima facie evidence doesn't mean it smells bad. It means there's something before us, something that is not just somebody saying something, you know, I heard with my buddy down at the spa when I went <laughs> shopping that this happened or I got a WhatsApp from a family member. It has to be evidence. And the question is whether the things that were placed before the panel actually are the kind of things that would go through as evidence. The president argues that most of it wouldn't because it would never be admissible in a court of law because it's clearly hearsay or it is speculation by Mr. Fraser who might well have an axe to grind. Yes, and I mean, that, that of course dwells into the whole political sphere of what is currently happening. I, I want to touch on the flaws, uh, uh, Professor DeFoss. One of them, of course, is that on the panel's own version of events, General Ruat, who of course is the police advisory to, or the advisor to the president, the failure lies with him and not with the president, who expected mm. General Ruat to report the matter in accordance with police procedures. So... Maybe just break it down for the for for our viewers because one may be thinking, well, if the the, the crime had happened at Palapala, 
The president was supposed mm. to pick up the phone and, of yeah. course, tell the police, listen, this has happened. There's been a break-in in my farm. How do I go ahead and take it? But then enter General Ruot. So maybe just break it down for us, the role of General Ruot in all of this. Okay, so uh, once again, from the information we have, mm. I'm always careful because one never knows yeah, sure. what mm. there's something else on, is the president phoned uh, General Ruot and told him there was a security breach and at some later date also told him that there was theft. Um, the legislation says when there's theft of more than 100,000 rand or corruption or whatever, then the, per the responsible person, the person in charge, has to report this to the Hawks Mm. or have to uh, get somebody else to report it. And so the argument is that General Ru uh, Ruet is actually a policeman, but he's uh, more in the VIP protection area, so it might have been the wrong person to report to. But the panel then says, well, the president did so, assuming that General Ruet would do what normally happens in the police. In other words, uh, approach the orcs. That never happened. Um, so, uh, in that sense, the panel seems to contradict itself because it says, well, the president reported it to a police officer, but the law requires more. Um, and uh, General Ruet was expected to do the right thing. He clearly didn't. He reported it to uh, a, a, um assistant general or whatever the term is in the police force who now passed away, mm -hmm. but not to the hawks. And so whether that now means that the president is the one who broke that law, but more importantly, whether he did so uh, in bad faith, in yes. other words, deliberately to try and cover something up. I wonder if there's enough evidence before the panel to make the to pass the first hurdle, but definitely the second hurdle, which is that it must be more than just you did something you shouldn't, you, you, you didn't do something you should have done. You, it, there should be proof that you did it in bad faith, deliberately, intentionally to actually hide what happened there. They, it, it, might have, it, it might have happened. There might have been an attempt to hide, but the evidence at the moment is maybe a little bit thin. Then, on what you have answered right now, Prof. Foss, the breaching of the Constitution, because we have this term being thrown all around. One of the major weaknesses, and I know you pointed that out also in your Daily Maverick article, was that it does not deal adequately with the question on whether any breaches of the Constitution or, or the law or any misconduct were of a serious nature. Mm. And there's one that the panel notes that not every violation of the Constitution or law or misconduct constitutes a ground for impeachment and removal of office because, of course, impeachment is one of those that have been the word that has been thrown around or used with regards mm. to what could happen at the National Assembly. So on, on what grounds does there have to be something serious in order for there to be, number one, a breach of constitution, and number two, for there to be the impeachment process? Yes. So the the rules of the National Assembly defines uh, what is serious in the context of breaching of the Constitution or the ordinary law. And they say there should be evidence that this is done intentionally. It's not because you were ne negligent or you just didn't, you were not uh, careful enough. And you have to show that it was done in bad faith. Mm. Presumably, a third requirement is that you have to show that the bridge itself is a serious bridge. Yes. If the president has a sparking ticket or a speeding fine, no matter what, it's never going to be a serious violation of the law. Um, obviously, if it is true that the, the president used his powers, the presidency, to go to another country, Namibia, and ask the president of Namibia to keep the whole thing quiet, that would be serious. Um, it would be a serious breach of the Constitution. And uh, I think it, 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 one would uh, also start thinking that it would be something done in bad faith, because if you want to hide things, there is always the, uh, the possibility of bad faith. Um, so, yes, but, but it, it depends on whether the, the crime or the breach of the Constitution is a serious one, that it's deliberately done, that it's done in bad faith. All of those things, which unfortunately the panel didn't really go into. Mm -hmm. They seem to suggest 
as long as the, the breach itself is something serious or potentially serious, they don't have to uh, ask whether this was done negligently or intentionally or whether the president did it with in bad faith or whether he just was a bit uh, bumbling mm -hmm. <laughs> in what he did, yeah. Well, Prof. Foss, before we go to the break, um, we of course saw Mr. Hazim was one of the, uh, the businessmen who had purchased cattle from uh, the Palapala Pala farm and he had said, and I quote that, I do not know who it belongs to. Now, I want to bring the, the foreign currency perspective with regards mm. to this because, of course, there's the PFMA Act that comes in and then there's the Reserve Bank that comes in. Now, we are talking dollars. We are talking big amount of dollars in the millions of dollars. What is the, uh, the, the, the duty of the collector, which is the one receiving the money, especially that amount, for them to have, of course, declared this money so that they can, of course, as we would say, go scot-free and mm. everything would be okay. Yes, so there are actually quite onerous obligations on somebody who receives foreign currency in South Africa for any transaction. There are some limits also on transactions, but that's very complicated. I don't know if that's an issue here. And you have to declare the, any foreign currency and you have to go to the bank and you have to exchange that foreign currency into South African dollars within, uh, I don't know if it's 48 hours, uh, 48 working hours after the transaction. So uh, this the, this uh, didn't happen in this case. It, it was the, the money was stolen two months after the, the transaction allegedly happened. Um, so obviously something there, there was some breach of the rules, maybe of the criminal law, in that case, the failure to declare whether the, the president is, of course, arguing, well, it wasn't my job to mm. do it. I'm not running pala pala every day. It's the manager's days. Maybe he's throwing them under the bus. <laughs> um, but so, so that would be the big question. Was the should we? It looks like something happened there that shouldn't have happened. It it look uh, it looks serious. Whether uh, uh, one would be able to say that there's evidence that the president was the one who had the obligation to do so, that is the question. But the panel didn't deal with this because that wasn't before the panel. It's not one of the issues that the ATM, one the party that mm. brought the the motion of impeachment, they didn't raise it as one of the grounds for the impeachment, exactly because the investigations into this is on, are ongoing and we don't actually know what the outcomes of those investigations will be. Well, we will be continuing this conversation with Professor Pierre Foss. We're going to be talking about the President's report, which he has brought to uh, the Constitutional Court and what happens next. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to Talking Point. Our first segment, we are discussing the constitutional take on the Section 89 report into the Pala Pala scandal of President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, Professor DeFoss, let's talk about this uh, report that has, of course, been given to the Constitutional Court. It's been taken on review, and the President has the attempt to set this aside. W what are his chances of this happening? Mm -hmm. I know we've spoken briefly on certain flaws and, of course, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, strengths to this report. How, how confident can he feel that this report can still be set aside and he can be, of course, to still be able to continue with his uh, duties as the president without having the scandal, you know, obviously clouding him? Yes, so uh, having read the, the papers, I must say the president obviously has excellent lawyers mm -hmm. that advise him. So it's a it's a good application. There are some hurdles. The first one is that they chose to go directly to the constitutional court, which um, is not uh, normally that would not be acceptable. And the constitutional court will not normally hear a case that is directly brought to it before it goes to the high court. It's only when only the constitutional court has the power to deal with the issue or where there's exceptional circumstances. I think uh, in this particular case, they might will I'll be successful with the direct access, but it's not a foregone conclusion. Then on the rest of the report, 
Um, they, I think it, there's a strong chance that it will be reviewed and set aside. Um, but it's it's the first time that courts are going to consider this matter. The rules of parliament on which this is based have never been uh, at an issue in a court of law. And there's a profound fundamental question at the heart of this, which depending how the court comes out on this, might either swing the matter in favor of the president or against him. And that is, what is the role of the of the panel? Mm -hmm. uh, is the role of the panel to uh, a kind of sniff test? They look at all the information. They say, mm, something smells wrong here. We're going to uh, recommend that there's a full investigation. Or is it, as the president suggests, that they must actually see whether there is sufficient evidence, as the rules say, mm -hmm. to um, at least make a prima facie case, at, to at least say, if all this information is before any anybody, any court, it will find the person guilty in the absence of proper explanations for it. Um, if the, the court says yes, the role of the panel is more than just saying, well, if this doesn't look nice, there are some questions unanswered. Um, if, if they say that the role of the panel is much more um, uh, strenuous, then the president is probably going to be successful with his review application. Mentioning what you said right now, uh, Professor DeFoss, and I mean, those are two key points right over there. Is the National Assembly bound by this? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 could they be bound by this? So the National Assembly is not bound by the panel report. Mm. But the, the rules of Parliament is based on a constitutional law uh, court case, uh, the EFF case, in which the court said that Parliament cannot impeach the president unless they are actually factually, mm. objectively serious. There was a serious violation of the constitution or, uh, or the law. So if the panel says there was not a violation and Parliament says we're going ahead nevertheless, and then they impeach, the, it can be overturned because the, the courts can say they are actually none of these grounds are there. Uh, Parliament is not bound by the recommendations, though, so if they don't have to follow them. They, the Parliament, when they meet next week, they can say we are not going to have um, a full investigation. We're not going to accept the panel's recommendations because we think the panel is wrong because it's uh, being taken on review or for whatever uh, other reason. Um, but of course, um, if they if the if they decide that there might be political consequences for for the parties that vote against this, if the voters think that uh, it, they, it should proceed, so the 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 issue here is more political accountability than than a legal issue. Prof. Voss, on what legal grounds can the opposition parties challenge this? Because we know that they're going to come out. Uh, I mean, it's clear that uh, especially the parties that hold the most seats, which are the EFF and the um, DA, would want to challenge this. So, so what, on what grounds do they have uh, a legal challenge on this? And there's, uh, on paper, theoretically, they could say that uh, the, pal the members of parliament must act rationally. So any exercise of public power must be done rationally. So they can say it's completely irrational for the members of parliament not to proceed, say, with the investigation when they should have. In practice, this will be almost impossible to convince a court of that it is irrational because parliament is made up of politicians, elected representatives, um, elected by the people through their parties. And a court, unelected judges, are, I don't think has ever, and I don't think they will easily, nullify a vote taken in the National Assembly uh, that is in essence a political vote, um, because that would be infringing on the separation of powers. I think the, the opposition parties would be much um, much uh, it wise of, to, to accept then the, this thing is stalling and to find other ways to hold the president accountable. For example, by insisting that he be called to the National Assembly, to say, forming through an ad hoc committee investigating this, and they can force it. The parliament has the power to summons even the president, if he do doesn't want to, to come and appear to testify, to give a full account. That doesn't need uh, the impeachment proceedings to be done, they can do it in another way through through the the uh, normal rules of parliament. Prof. Foss, uh, the ANC of course held their NEC this weekend, and 
it seems as if they are rallying around their leader and they're going to try and use certain flaws of this report to justify the reason for them to rally around their leader. Naturally, they would do that. I mean, there are reports that there are certain NDC members and certain ministers within the cabinet that would vote against the president in the impeachment. But uh, based on these flaws, I mean, this is a wise move from the ANC, isn't it, to, to rally around their leader uh, just to mm -hmm. make sure that, of course, with just a week to go before the elective conference, this would be a wise move from them. Um, well, I don't know if, if I am uh, competent to, yeah. to say whether it's a wise move or not. Yeah. I will say this, though, is that um, the way our system works, mm. it is almost inevitable that uh, the political party, like the governing party, is going to do what the ANC now does, protect their president. Um, and they also have the power to do so because of our electoral system. If you're a member of the National Assembly and you're not, um, and you want to vote, for the impeachment proceedings, then you're going to run into trouble. You might be kicked out of the party. You will lose your seat in the National Assembly. Um, so, uh, so in this case, so uh, that's why normally in all cases where there's been an impeachment, the Nash, the ANC, uh, or uh, even a vote of no conference, the ANC members have towed the party line. Um, this case, they might have more reason because there's a review and because yeah. the review is not frivolous. It is not just a stalling tactic in this sense that there are actually possibility that the review might be successful. So that is not uh, that is that is uh, that gives them maybe more of a justification to do this than in other cases where they have also just uh, blindly supported the leader for as long as at least as he is leader of the party. Prof. Voss, one final question. Uh, does President Cyril Ramaphosa become successful after the review is done and does he have this report set aside? Um, well, I think that the chances, I one can never say definitively, yes. but I think the chances are good that the report will be reviewed and set aside. That, however, is probably not going to be the end of the matter because um, there are still questions that are not answered and that we don't really know what exactly happened. Um, so the, it's not as if this will be a line in the sand and that will be the end of the scandal. I, I, that will be surprising if that is the case. Prof. Foss, uh, we'd like to say thank you so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Pleasure. Well, that's it, Professor Pierre de Foss, constitutional law expert, just breaking down uh, constitutionally the pros and the cons of the Section 89 report and whether President Sol Ramaphosa still has a chance to have this report set aside. Remember, it has gone to the Constitutional Court. The question is, what happens next? After the break, I'll be joined by political analyst Kim Heller to break down what is happening in the ANC from a political perspective and also what happens now heading into the elective conference, which starts next weekend. Do stay tuned.